And thank you, Francois, for inviting me and for organizing this workshop. So today I'll be talking about uh, rules and what it is for them to be in force. So more specifically, uh, our topic will be what I call regulative rules or what sometimes have been called regulations. So it's easiest, I mean, I'll say more as when we go along as to what these sorts of things should be distinguished from, but uh, it's easier to, easiest to uh, identify the subject by examples. So, you know, social rules like rules of etiquette and legal rules like traffic rules will be the paradigmatic examples. Uh, so for example, you must wear black to funerals, you must drive on the right. Uh, so that those are the sorts of things I paradigmatically have in mind by regulative rules. Um, these also include some, I think, of what are known as constitutive rules, so specifically rules of games, language, and assertion. Uh, you know, there are some other things very different from these things that are also called constitutive rules. Uh, it doesn't include those. Um, but, you know, you don't have to... Um, agree with me on this, it won't really play any role. So it'll be mostly about regulated rules. Um, but as, as an example, so the putative rule of assertion, one may say that P if and only if one knows that P. Um, so this will be our topic. And regulated rules, I think, are a sort of distinctive normative kind. Um, there are two contrasts that are important, I think. Um, so rules versus orders. Um, even sort of general orders given by an authority, and rules versus normative truths. So the second contrast, I think, is in many ways more important and less appreciated. And the first one won't really play a role here, so if you really insist on thinking of rules in an imperatival manner, I, you, know, you can still probably accept a lot of what I have to say, so it won't be that important. Uh, but I think rules are unlike orders in having propositional normative content, but unlike normative truths, you're not being true, but in force. Um, so what does this mean? Well, I think sort of in contemporary philosophy of law, um, the propositional view that sort of stems from Hart and was already uh, subscribed to by Reinach um, is the dominant view. So rules are taken to have propositional content that attributes an action type some deontic status, perhaps in certain general conditions. Um, so these are three ways, normal forms, in which rules can be written down. So you know, if, only if, if, and only if in certain conditions, doing A is either required or prohibited or permissible, or you could write, down it, write it down with a one or a quantifier. Uh, so rules as such then are things that have propositional content. They're not the just the bare contents themselves, right? The bare content is not the rule. Um, now, rules uh, must be, I think, distinguished from normative truths, and this is very important, and they're frequently run together with normative truths. Uh, and there's a, you know, there's a use of the word rule in which people also use it to talk about normative truths. For example, when they say moral rules, uh, you know, it's fine, we're not quibbling over words here. It's important to just isolate like in a distinctive explanatory kind. So uh, normative truths, you know, like moral truths or sort of more run of the mill strategic truths uh, are true, right? That's why they're truths. So they're in the business of truth and falsity. So putative normative truths are, you know, either true or false. Uh, and what Rawls called summary rules are actually just such normative truths. I think should not be called rules at all. Uh, they summarize independent considerations and they're true or false, depending on you know, whether they get it right or not. But rules are not like that, right? So you, you can contrast, you must wear black to funerals with you ought to open with a center pawn. So you ought to open with a center pawn is some sort of a chess strategy generalization, which is either true or false, depending on you know, what the the strategy is. Um, whereas uh, you must wear back to funerals, I think, is not in the business of truth and falsity. It's a rule. So both have propositional content. They, have, they can share some of them. These sorts of things can share their content. But uh, while putative normative truths like T are true or false, rules like R are in force. Yeah? 
And for rules to be enforced is not for them to be true. Right? So being enforced does not consist in truth. Um, in fact, we can say something stronger, like being rules are not even in the business of truth and falsity. Um, the contents don't have to be true in any sense for rules to be enforced. Uh, so for rules to be enforced is for them to be enacted or accepted. Which is sort of a common view. Um, there's two different ways in which rules come to be enforced, and I will be uh, talking more about them. And the key point is that enactment and acceptance aren't even in the business of truth and falsity. So to say a bit more, here's Reinach on enactment. So Reinach writes, the proposition, the ability of man to be a subject of rights begins with, with the completion of birth, has just as little a hypothetical character as does the proposition man is mortal. And further, it cannot possibly be considered to be a judgment. We do not have here a positing of being which, according as this being is really there or not, could be judged as true or false. We don't try to represent pre-existing reality. We rather have an enactment which stands beyond the alternative of true or false. And you know, you see similar sorts of things said about rules uh, frequently, you know, by black, by heart, and so on. Um, so here's one way to put it. So to make a rule, to put one in force, to enact is not to judge or assert or do anything similar, right? So as Reinhardt puts it, enactments aren't conforming acts, anpassungsakte. Or in Austin's terms, enactments aren't constitutive. They don't seek to represent what already is the case, right? pre-existing reality. Uh, and so therefore, they're not correct, incorrect, depending on whether they get it right. So that's in contrast to judgments and beliefs and assertions, which do try to do that. Right? So enactment is not a constitutive act. Instead, Enactments are performative. They seek to make something the case. They institute new normative reality. Uh, so the same way in which Kevin, when he opened the session, made it the case that the session was open and wasn't representing pre-existing reality, the same way enactments uh, create new normative reality. Right? They're correct, uh, in some sense of correct, if the enactor has the requisite authority, right? not depending on whether uh, you know, what's already the case in the world, yeah? So enactments are performative. Now, there's this special case of enacting for oneself. Um, so you might think we all have authority to make rules for ourselves. Oh. But enacting a rule for oneself seems, you know, at least a little different from enactment, um, but also quite similar in some respects. It's still think we can like, keep them apart, but they go in the sort of division between how rules come to be enforced, they kind of go in one bracket, uh, in one bucket. Um, so enacting a rule for oneself can be thought in terms of in a sort of explicit personal level, voluntary self-imposition of a constraint. So you explicitly represent a normative content to yourself, and then you sort of have the thought that you will adopt this or endorse this rule as a constraint on your behavior for these and these reasons. And then you have to find ways to keep yourself to be motivated to act in accordance with it by all sorts of techniques of self-management. Right? So you adopt the rule that you're not going to eat any carbs after you know, 3 o'clock, and then you have to resist all the cakes. Right? So you find ways to do that. Uh, so that's sort of like enacting a rule for oneself. Um, but at least like this sort of imposition um, of a constraint in yourself is still kind of explicit and chosen and per sort of a personal level phenomenon. Right? You do it. You know, frequently you also vow it. You sort of say it out loud or talk to others about your commitment to veganism or something. Um, now, and then besides, besides enactment, there's acceptance. Um, which is sort of thought to be the other way a rule comes to be enforced, and which is quite different. So here's Hart. Um, 
sort of talking about his practice theory of rules. So Hart, Hart writes, the content given of these social rules has become known as the practice theory of rules because it treats the social rules of a group as constituted by a form of social practice comprising both patterns of conduct regularly followed by most members of the group and a distinctive normally attitude to such patterns of conduct, which I have called acceptance. Or, you know, he also characterizes it as taking the internal point of view. Um, this consists in the standing disposition of individuals to take such patterns of conduct, both as guides to their own future conduct and the standards of criticism, which may legitimate demands and various forms of pressure for conformity. And that's pretty much all he says. And that sort of suffices for his purposes. But if we want to know more about what acceptance consists in, uh, you know, it's especially kind of from a more philosophy of mind point of view, we have to dig a little deeper. Um, now, just a few comments. So Hart's practice theory uh, is the following, or sort of thinks that for a conventional rule to be enforced in a community, there has to be an actual regularity in behavior in the community. Where the members take an eye internal point of view towards it, right? They accept it as a rule. Um, and for the regularity to provide reasons for participants to either accept it as a rule or to follow it. So the idea is, you know, people behave in a particular sort of regular manner, then people accept that, you know, this is how things must or must be done, for example. And the very fact that the regularity exists provides the reasons for this acceptance. Right? That's why it's uh, conventional. Right. Now, people have argued that the practice theory is problematic in requiring an actual regularity in behavior. You could have rules enforced, social rules enforced where the actual regularity um, is absent. Right? So in secret, everybody behaves the other way. <laughs> um, so instead, you know, contemporary Hartians uh, frequently propose this kind of view. This is a practice-dependent view. So uh, for a rule to be enforced, there just has to be a presumed regularity in behavior, not an actual regularity. Uh, otherwise, you know, there's still acceptance. And the presumed regularity is which provides the grounds why participants accept the rules. So they accept them because there is the presumed regularity, and that what, that's what makes these rules conventional. And so this sort of view doesn't require an actual regularity. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here just is that all of these sorts of views depend on the notion of acceptance. Right? So then the question becomes, what is it to accept a rule? What kind of attitude is acceptance? How do we think of acceptance on part of the our community and you know, on part of ultimately the individuals? Right? Now, here's a bit of I mean, you know, maybe this is some way, in some way, like terminological legislation, but it's not too far from, I think, how people think about it. I mean, I think enactment in general, right, is best thought in like explicit terms. You explicitly represent a rule and enact it publicly by means of a speech act, right? or for yourself by means of explicit thought. And we could use the notion of acceptance or the word acceptance so that this rules out these forms of uh, adopting the rules, so to speak. Right? So that like self-enactment is distinct from acceptance. We could reserve acceptance for the attitude where we have sort of implicitly internalized the rule. Right? So where, where enactment goes better with the language of um, adoption and endorsement of a rule, which is sometimes used, right? Um, acceptance or internalization goes better with the language of, you know, acknowledgement or recognition of a rule, something like that. It sounds more passive, it sounds more implicit. Um, so, so when we think of acceptance, it's better to think of it in, uh, or like sort of, you know, there is this way this more implicit way in which rules come to be enforced, right? They just sort of become accepted without anybody sort of voluntarily self-imposing them or nobody legislating from them, them from, from the above. And so acceptance seems better reserved for that kind of state. And the question is, what is it to um, have that kind of attitude or to be in that kind of state? And of course, the key point should always be kept in mind. So like 
enactment, acceptance of a rule can't be something constitutive, right? Because rules are not in the business of truth and falsity. Um, so what kind of an attitude is acceptance, or could it be? Uh, and here are the five options I will discuss. Um, and this part, I will say, is exploratory. I'm sort of trying to figure out the terrain of options here. Um, I have some sympathy for the last view, but it very much depends on um, you know, contentious ongoing program in cognitive science. So, um, but it seems to fit the bill. But anyway, we will, we will sort of work towards that. So what could acceptance be? So um, here's the sort of simplest view that's sometimes um, proposed. You know, to accept a rule is simply to have a set of behavioral dispositions. And these dis dispositions are behavioral. And I put it in quotes because basically the point is they can be understood without invoking any representational attitudes. So no attitudes attributing the very deontic statuses themselves. So to adopt, or sorry, to accept the rule that you ought to wear funerals, sorry, you, you ought to wear, or you must wear black to funerals, you know, you don't have to have like any representational state that has that content. You just have a set of dispositions. You know, and they're behavioral and, you know, sort of thought to be not involving any sort of representational attitudes at any level. So for example, you get something like this view discussed by Hogland and Brandon criticizing Hogland. You know, it's a set of dispositions, it's like this dual set of dispositions where you have dispositions to conform to the rule, to sort to behave in the sort of relevant manner, the required manner, say. Um, but that alone doesn't suffice, nobody thinks, right? Because regularities in behavior you know, don't specify any particular rule. Um, they're compatible with a multitude of rules, right? This is Wittgenstein's, one of Wittgenstein's points. Um, but also coupled with dispositions to censure, um, where this can be understood as, you know, you feel bad upon nonconformity yourself, and you have some effective pressure towards conformity. And, you know, when you don't sort of do uh, or behave in the manner um, that the rule requires that you've accepted, then you sanction yourself, and you sanction others, and so on. Um, and so Hogland sort of proposes this kind of a view on behalf of Heidegger in this whole paper. And Brandom discusses and criticizes it, and his, his own view actually kind of turns out to be a view of this kind, if you think about it a little bit deeper, as, as Gideon Rosen and Anandi Hatiangari have argued. Um, and ultimately, I think, I think this gets pretty close to the truth. But uh, it needs to be enriched in some ways. Um, so you will see what I mean when we get there. So what are the problems standardly sort of the standard problems for the sort of pure behavioral dispositions view. So, uh, you know, as always, it is claimed that the set of dispositions is not enough to determine a precise rule. Uh, sort of, Brandon calls the Wittgensteinian gerrymandering objection, right? So for any regularity in behavior, this is compatible with different sorts of rules. Um, and then Brandon also claims, you know, it fails to capture the sort of normativity distinctive of rules, right? All you have is motivational stuff. Uh, it's not actually clear to me how big these problems are, and we'll come back to this um, when we get to the final view, which turns out to be quite similar. Um, so I think this view gets a lot right, but it's not quite there. Uh, but now we come to very different sorts of views, right? So. Here's another kind of prominent family of views on which, uh, and these views to accept a rule is to have the right sorts of combinations of non-normative personal level attitudes. So typically a cluster of desires. 
So these are attitudes are supposed to be non-normative in the sense that they don't attribute the deontic statuses, right? It's just desires that people behave a certain way, perhaps conditional on um, others behaving the same way and so on. So Bikiri's account is the most developed sort of account in this family. Um, so on her view, a rule content P is a social rule within a group G if a significant proportion of the members of G prefer to comply with P on the condition that and then a significant proportion of the members of G comply with P. So you know, have this conditional desire to uh, behave in this manner, condition on others also behaving in this manner. And then furthermore, others expect you to comply this way or um, others expect you to comply this way, you prefer you to comply this way, and may sanction you for not complying this way. Um, so the difference between these is actually not clear, but not very important for us. Because the problem is, and I, I won't go in deep because this has been extensively criticized by Brennan Erickson, uh, Goodman and Southwood in their book Explaining Norms. Um, and, I, um, and any sort of set of such desires is intuitively both insufficient and unnecessary for there to be a rule. So you don't get a rule up and running with such a set of desires. And also there could be rules up and running where people don't have these sorts of desires. This can be brought out with a number of intuitive examples. So for example, uh, there could be a set of such preferences in place and yet no rule enforced. So Chastians, the example is something like this. So there's a society of very chaste people, the Chastians. And, uh, so there's a rule um, against premarital sex. Uh, but everybody secretly prefers or is thrilled at the idea of premarital sex and sort of would prefer others to think the same way and, and so on and so on. So the cluster of desires is in place, but there is no rule uh, permitting premarital sex. There's a rule against it. Um, and the opposite sort of example, right, is there could be rules enforced where everyone actually has the opposite preferences. So um, you know, there could be a rule that you, a social rule that you, uh, must give half of your income to charity. Uh, you know, every, nobody prefers to do this, and nobody cares at all what others think, uh, or you know, their preferences aren't even conditional. They would just like to buy luxury goods. So I, I, mean, I won't spell this or spend very much time on this. Um, here, you could just look at the book. I don't want to reproduce it all. Uh, the point is, to me at least, it's always seemed very convincing that these sorts of accounts don't get rules up and running at all. They just get you the wrong results. Um, so the most common sort of view these days is some sort of a normative attitudes view, where the normative attitudes are taken to be personal level. And this kind of follows what Hart says, right? So when you go back, um, Hart says, you know, acceptance is a distinctive normative attitude. Even though, of course, if you read what Hart says, he says, you know, it consists of dispositions to take such patterns of conduct both as guides and standards of criticism, and which may legitimate demands and various forms of pressure for conformity. He so says, not really clear whether Hart writing in uh, 61 or even later in the postscript, like, had something very strong in mind by calling it a normative attitude, or it's sort of like not totally clear how he thought about it. Um, but um, but Brandon Erickson, uh, Goodman, and Southwood are um, they think um, you know to accept a rule is to have the right sorts of combinations of normative personal level attitudes, attitudes with normative content. So attitudes some of which at least attribute the very deontic status that's mentioned in the rule, attitudes which reflect the content of the rule. So more specifically, they say this, so for a person to accept the rule R is for her to have certain R corresponding normative attitudes. And they give a list of examples. So normative beliefs and judgments, 
where it's sort of easy to see how they could reflect the content of the rule. Then they say normative expectations, but they don't really elaborate very much. And those just sort of say it's expectations for others to actually behave in this manner. And then when they don't, then you sort of feel some sort of, you know, normatively loaded feelings. Um, and for example, you have reactive attitudes or dispositions to have such attitudes. And then any other attitudes that entail A to C, where all of these reflect the content and force of the rule. Um, so all of, all of this, I mean, this is pretty much as far as they go. And it's all pretty vague. But the problem I have with this sort of a picture is that it's not really clear what's supposed to be doing the work here. What actually sort of puts the rule in force. Because the key point again is that acceptance can't predominantly consist in beliefs and judgments with normative content because these are constative, right? And rules don't seem to represent pre-existing reality. So, um, And you will see, like, going that way or making that as sort of the centerpiece of the theory uh, gets us into what I'll call Kaplan's new problem anyway. But um, we'll come back to this. And so if that's not the thing doing the work, then something else must be doing the work. We're not really being told what. Like which of these attitudes actually gives the rule its sort of normative hold on the person who accepts it? Right? It's fine that in the cluster you could have later beliefs and judgments that you know that's sort of what you're required to do, but that couldn't really be what what, what puts the rule in force. Um, at least not straightforward. So, okay. So let me talk now about Kaplan's new problem. So Kaplan, Jeffrey Kaplan, has recently called what he, posed what he calls a new problem for um, rules, thinks there's no metaphysical explanation of what it is for rules to be in force, goes through all of these sorts of accounts. There are problems with all of them, the pure behavioral view and the sort of Bikiri style of um, cluster of non-normative attitudes view, but mostly Kaplan focuses on the normative attitudes view. Um, and then he thinks such views have to make a critical choice. So they have to choose whether they take the attitudes to represent the action as A, sort of authoritatively or robustly or really normative, involving like genuine authoritative deontic statuses, uh, the same way in which like morality or prudence or like deliberation are thought to, right? So the contrast is supposed to be, you know, these are these like g real genuine reasons or whatever, oughts, musts, mays that have a hold on us, right? Independently of what we think or what we desire or so on. And you know, this, is, this is the sort of normativity that's supposed to be mysterious. Right. That's what a lot of metanormative theory worries about. That's the sort of thing you can be an error theorist about. There is no such thing. Right? Um, you know, nobody doubts formal normativity. Right? So, so they either have to say that the attitudes, the normative attitudes, the sort of must or whatever the relevant deontic notion is in the, in the particular case, is sort of one where like it's supposed to be really authoritatively normative, like the same way moral morality is or prudence, perhaps. Or it's just merely the attitudes merely represented as sort of formally or what's you know frequently called formally or generically normative, as something that merely violates some rule or standard that is in force. But we don't really have to care about it necessarily, right? It doesn't have this intrinsic, inbuilt, mysterious, normative hold on us. 
right? So like, uh, you know. When mafia has some rules, those rules are enforced, right? So those count as formally normative. Nobody thinks they're authoritatively normative. Right? That's the sort of distinction. In contrast, morality, most philosophers at least tend to think is authoritatively normative. Um, so that's the contrast. Now, so the normative attitude accounts, they have to choose. They go one way or the other. And he thinks in both cases, the accounts are in trouble. So here's what he says about the robust views. He says they're just sort of implausible. They make the regulative rules look out to be like summary rules, right? Um, so to accept the rule that one must wear black to funerals, uh, he sort of construes as the robust option as, you know, thinking that, you know, people kind of have the attitude of thinking that that's like really required, I don't know, according prudence or morality or something, um, or, you know, there are genuine reasons for this. And then the rule just summarizes such independently. Um, like people sort of, opinions about these independently existing reasons, right? Those opinions don't have to be correct. They can all be false, um, of course. But the point is that, you know, the only way he thinks that this robust account could work is, is along those lines, right? And he thinks, you know, regulative rules are just not summary rules. So they don't summarize independent considerations of authoritative spheres like morality, prudence, or deliberation. But I think he dismisses this robust option a bit too quick, because there's another way of thinking about how you could have an attitude that um, involves a sort of robust geontic notion or appeals to a robust geontic notion. And then on the other hand, he thinks formal views are circular. Right? And that's a bit easier to see, or that's sort of, um, at least in the face of it, that's sort of convincing. So. Because on this picture, then, to accept the rule that one must wear black to funerals is to have a normative attitudes, the content of which involves a sense of must, that involves the very rule being enforced, which in turn depends on such acceptance and so on, and you're just sort of moving in a circle. Um, this might also be too quick, but I'm not so sure. I mean, um, but at least on the face of it, like this is this is somewhat convincing, right? And if a rule to be enforced is for you to accept that rule is, and for your acceptance to involve a sense of must, which is in, ter in turn explained in terms of a rules being enforced, uh, you at least seem to be moving in a very tight circle. So you must do something. Okay. Now, here's a completely different sort of proposal. And one in which I think can be unpacked both in the, um, in the robust or formal way. Um, and this has been proposed by Adam Perry um, on a sort of kind of completely unknown paper on Hart, um, and also more recently by Daniel Wodak. Um, and the idea is, you know, to accept a rule really is to, like, accept in the Phil Mind language sense a normative content, right? Where in the Phil Mind language sense, it's acceptance is something like you treat a proposition as if it were true. You don't believe it, you don't judge it to be true, but you treat it as if it were true for some practical purpose. The claim here is that acceptance of a rule is just like that very thing. It's basically your, you know, engaging in a fiction of some sort. Um, so here are some ex uh, differences between belief and acceptance in this sense. So belief aims at truth in a sensitive to evidence. Acceptance in this sense doesn't aim at truth and is insensitive to evidence. Right? One's context independent, the other's context dependent. So you can accept a proposition as if true in some contexts, but not in others, right? So, uh, you know. 
people in like stores or store clerks um, accept the proposition at work that the customer is always right. right? They don't accept it in other contexts. Uh, but you know, sort of they're accepting this as fiction is sort of what guides their behavior and so on. That's the sort of idea. Right? And you know, beliefs not under direct voluntary control, acceptance is under direct voluntary control. So the idea is to accept the rule just is to do this very same thing that we call acceptance in other contexts, to treat it as if true. So if the rule is you must wear black to funerals, uh, to accept this rule is to treat the normative content as if it were true, for some and some sorts of reasons. And this respects, of course, the key point. So to treat as if true is not to do something constantly, right? It's not to represent pre-existing reality. Uh, but we do here face Kaplan's dilemma. Is, is the deontic status in the normative content supposed to represent the action as sort of robustly or formally required. But now, since we're engaging in fiction, actually both options seem on the table. At least one is clearly on the table and has been proposed as an explanation of all formal normativity. That all norm formal normativity is fiction making and it depends on authoritative normativity. So that's Wodak's view, right? So, you know, whenever, we're uh, whenever we have a formal norm or whatever, what we're really doing is pretending that it's morally or prudentially or deliberately so on required. Uh, and so this is a very different way of thinking that the normative uh, content, right, the deontic status is, is a robust one. But it's not actually attributed to the action we just pretend that the action has it. And that's a way to sort of go the robust way, which is unlike the sort of way Kaplan discussed, where you just get a summary or something. Um, so in other words, we fictionalize and think that in the fiction of etiquette or law or games or assertion, you know, the relevant action, whatever it is, is like really required, authoritatively required. Like what the right sense of uh, must or ought or may there is, you know, we can like choose. I mean, it probably won't be moral or prudential in some cases. In the case of law, it might be moral in some views at least. In other views, it won't. In some views, it might just be the deliberative, sort of all things considered must. Um, or, you know, these sorts of views could go the former route. So you're sort of say, then you're going to say, we're pretending that it is required relative to an existing rule that is in force, even though there is no such existing rule. Right? So is this still circular? I mean, it kind of seems to, but I, I don't know. Um, at least somebody could try this sort of a view out. But the robust option has been defended. Um, so how about this then as a view of acceptance? Right? You do have a normative attitude. It's also like a fictive attitude. Um, it's a personal level attitude again. So uh, what, how plausible is this? So, I mean, I think it's intriguing, but it seems more suited to enactment or other forms of sort of explicit adoption of rules, right? The very notion of acceptance is the sort of high level, sort of personal level notion um, suited to sort of you know, you explicitly represent some content, and then you act as if it were true or something. Um, seems somewhat more implausible for the sort of state where, whereby people implicitly internalize a rule. Um, but you know, it's, it's an intriguing proposal that requires more discussion, basically. So I'm not going to say more about this here. I'm just going to introduce the final option now. Um, and the final option is to think that the behavioral dispositions view you know, got things pretty close to right, except they didn't really, or they weren't really sophisticated enough. So, so here the claim is something like, to accept the rule is to have a subpersonal normative attitude, or even the normative attitude can be put in scare, scare quotes, 
it's not clear in what sense it's a normative attitude. Um, but more specifically, it's for the rule to be represented by one's norm system. And here's the idea. So many in recent sort of cognitive science have started defending the view that human minds feature a subpersonal system dedicated to norms and their internalization. Uh, so the functions of this system are to detect and acquire norms from the social environment and to generate intrinsic motivation to act in accordance with it. So it's sort of to generate sort of self-oriented motivations and, and to generate intrinsic motivation to enforce them on others. So there's also an other orientation. So the picture is something like we're all born with this sort of norm system. And it's, it's looking for regularities to latch onto and interpret them as rules. And this is sort of widely um, studied and you know, I won't be able to get into any of this here, um, but you, know, you can think about how little kids sort of try to See, see a rule everywhere and try to enforce it on their, uh, on their siblings and something like that. So sort of, you know, the idea is we're like born normative animals already. The system's in place. It starts looking for these regularities. Then the regularities it finds, it latches onto and it treats them as rules. Um, and it generates motivation to comply and motivation to enforce it on others. And these motivations are intrinsic motivations. They're, it's not motivation because you, know, you get rewarded or for instrumental reasons or whatever. And you know, it seems like, I mean, this seems like perfectly to fit the bill. <laughs> of course, it, you, know, you could argue that it just posits what's needed, but um, that's how it sometimes works. <laughs> it's backed by the relevant sort of data. Um, Anyway, so the norm system has cognitive aspects, but also sort of affective and motivational aspects, which generate the intrinsic motivation to conformity, right? And of course, this view also respects the key points. The representation in the norm system is not something constitutive. Uh, and the affective motivational aspects seem to capture Hart's idea of an internal point of view, right? So like, you're like in, in the game, sort of you're, you're in there. You have the intrinsic motivation to comply and enforce. You don't know why. The fast, you're just sort of like, that's how it's done. Right? And the idea is that is what is it to have accepted the rule. And it's all very implicit. It's not personal level. It's not like explicit adoption of it. Yeah? And it's not clear, I think, that Kaplan's problem applies here because it's not clear that representation in the norm system is in terms of a deontic concept. It's not clear there's an explicit representation of a must or something. So in that way, it can get pretty close to what the people in the behavioral dispositions view had in mind. It's just sort of made more sophisticated. Um, but even if it is in terms of a deontic concept, it's not plausibly neither authoritative nor formal, but somehow more, a more basic sort. But this is all kind of open, right? Like we need to know a lot more about how this whole stuff works. But as a, as a sort of hypothesis of what acceptance is, this seems to me to be most promising. Um, so in comparison, right, so what the behavioral dispositions view then gets right, according to this view, is that acceptance doesn't consist in ordinary personal level attitudes. It's far less sort of personal level cognitively involved. Hmm. But it isn't a matter of simple behavioral dispositions. There's a dedicated norm system, and it's a representation of a rule by this dedicated norm system, right, which which looks for these regularities and then generates these intrinsic motivations for compliance and enforcement. Okay. Are there any worries about this view? I mean, I'm sure there are plenty, but you might ask whether the same sorts of worries apply as to the behavioral dispositions view. So do we get a precise rule determined if one isn't sort of explicitly represented even in the norm system? Where you know, this work is still kind of in its relatively early stages, so they, don't really, they haven't really told us how they think about it. Um, but, yes, I'm just going to. Um, but I think, I mean, you know, you can, get, you can get a reasonably precise rule 
in this way while keeping plausible open texture. So like, you know, you soak up a regularity and then you sort of know in what way you're s supposed to do these things and you have some sense of what you're going to censure and so on. But you know, there might be like, new sorts of cases that come up that you don't know anything to say, you know, what, what to say about. You know, a la Wittgenstein. So, but that's sort of to be expected, right? That's sort of to be expected anyway, I think. And the second problem, I think, is, you know, does it capture the normativity? But nobody ever thought, really, that rules have authoritative normativity, right? Uh, and it was rules, regulated rules, were always supposed to be themselves formally normative. They're just sort of these things we can, you know, disregard. And I really think rules of etiquette by themselves have any authoritative force. That's how rules are different from morality. Um, and it's not really that implausible that the grounds of formal normativity are, are social motivation, right? That to talk about normativity in that sense just is to talk about something motivational at bottom. Um, so, That, I think, is pretty much it as far as this part. So in conclusion, so here's how you might think about how rules come to be enforced. So you have an enactment by an authority, so this is sort of explicit and performative. I'm sure there's lots more to be said about enactment. But you know, what are the sorts of rules that come in force by enactment? So parental rules, you, know, you make a rule for your children, you know, some sort of club rules, law, Sometimes games, when it's the uh, officials that put the rules in force. Uh, so then the sort of adoption, a matter of self-imposing constraint. So you know, the rules you make for yourself. Sometimes I think also games can be thought of in this model, right? So there's a set of rule contents. To play a game, you sort of voluntarily self-impose them. You put them in force for yourself for the time of the game. And maybe also assertion, if you think assertion sort of um, voluntary and not in any sense like one that you must perform when you say, right, that you could choose to assert or perform any of the other speech acts, then, then on that view, like, uh, to sort of put the rule in force for yourself at the time is something like adoption. And then acceptance, right, where this can be thought of in terms of representation in the norm system, and that would then go for most sorts of social rules, um, or like at least many social rules, and perhaps also language. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.